Hello and welcome to All Indians Matter. I am Ashraf Engineer. Especially after the COP27 climate change conference, developing nations have been vocal about needing significant financial support to achieve their climate targets. India's compliance with climate action hinges on funding much of it from developed nations and it has in the past stated that it needs an estimated 2.5 trillion dollars by 2030 from international sources to meet its targets. This represents significant climate finance opportunities as well as challenges. What exactly is India up against and what can it do to overcome it? With the union budget not too far away, is there something the finance minister can do? All Indians matter. We have on the show Suranjali Tandon, assistant professor at the National Institute of Public Finance and Policy. She leads the institute's work on sustainable finance and taxation. Welcome Suranjali. Thank you, Ashok. Suranjali, the money currently being channelized for climate action is barely one percent to ten percent of the estimated requirement. Could you give an overview of the enormity of the problem for India? Ashok, it's an enormous problem if you look at it in terms of finance. So, over the last one or two years, been hearing about India announcing its net zero plan, and there is a figure attached to that net zero. so you know you have standard chartered bank which is talking about investment of 12 trillion dollars which is required to meet that target even today there are nationally determined contribution that india has signed up for and needs to shift to renewables and you know if you just look at the numbers the required investment is 44 billion dollars and we still you know a third of what needs to be invested is being invested so there is a huge gap in the required level of investment and available finance and i think that speaks to the enormity of the problem well you know we also talk about the shift in the economy that you will be seeing post change towards the low carbon transition and that itself again presents a daunting task for planners as they imagine new sectors and uh, the kinds of production processes that will support this new economy Right so at COP27 in Sharm El Sheikh Egypt countries agreed that a complete transformation of the international financial system was needed to significantly scale up resources for climate action what did they envisage well i think it's a recognition which is quite intuitive to anyone who looks at the funding gap it's quite clear that public finances will not be enough not just because you know covid has hit public finances rather drastically across countries but also as you look at a transition pathway which is the future where you know fossil fuels will go down the share in tax revenues of these fossil fuels will also go down and which means that the you know the fiscal space available is low so i think it is a recognition of a fairly understood point that finance will have to be scaled up if you look at the press release of decisions uh, made at the sharm el sheikh uh, you know there is a push towards recognizing that all financial sector actors which includes the government and the central banks will have to respond to this change and if you look at the documents this year there have been several announcements around finance one of which is you know the loss and damage fund i'm glad you mentioned that because i was about to ask about that in fact at cop 27 decision was taken to set up this loss and damage fund so could you detail what exactly it is yeah ashok so it's a lot of things but it's very unclear at the moment so Uh, the loss and damage fund is something that developing countries were asking for many decades you know they were asserting the fact that there is a historical context to emissions developed countries have had their share of the carbon budget and unfortunately the incidence of that is now being borne by small developing countries some that are you know actually afraid that they will be submerged in water with the rising sea levels and loss and damage fund in that sense is a victory for some of these countries including pakistan that you know faced a disastrous flood earlier uh, so it's a victory for those countries but i would say it's incomplete victory because it doesn't talk about who's going to finance this if you look back at the history of funding there's been this allocation of 100 billion dollars which is still not fulfilled so i think the first question is how is this going to be funded the second is who's going to fund it third is how our country is going to access it so you know if you look at the total estimates by un the finance that is actually coming forth is not adequate so the question of access will of course become absolutely important 
Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the cumulative requirement of developing countries just for implementing their climate action plans is estimated at $6 trillion between now and 2030. At least that's one of the estimates that I read. I know different uh, people estimate it differently. That's a lot of money. And where is it going to come from? Yeah, that's a good question, Ashraf, because I think everyone's scrambling to figure that out. Even if you hear the conversations on the sidelines of COP27, there were countries that were asserting that, well, we have to look at private finance. And you, know, you and I, if we look at the markets, we know that climate change is a result of market failure. So I think there are two ways to scale up finance. One is, of course, to imagine a general change in tax policy, which can support the public spending side on this, because, you know, let's not be oblivious to the social costs around transition. And I think second is regulation. So what you've seen even in India is that there are standards of disclosure, which, you know, are being implemented to make companies behave better and there's investor pressure. So I think the second way to do this is to tame capital to be greatly in line with this future prospect of a low carbon economy and by introducing costs or by you know introducing a cap and trade system or by just disclosures uh, to investors who are sensitive to such information would be extremely useful i think to reach that level of finance yeah absolutely and i'm so glad you mentioned the social costs because we've had so many guests come on the show and talk about it and how the cost is actually born normally by the people who haven't caused the problem but uh, you know that's a whole different discussion altogether I, I want to stick to finance and it is said that there are two dimensions to the problem of climate finance availability and access some of which you alluded to when we talked about the disaster fund now what exactly does this mean in layman's terms yes uh, so Ashraf breaking down the issue of equity and access. What is equity? Equity is again talking about where are these costs emanating from and who's paying for them. So as you would see that, you know, most of the developed countries are also capital exporters. And so therefore they have access to capital and they're able to fund. The other is developing countries are seeking to bear costs and uh, you know, this is the inequity of it. So there would be private capital available where it may perhaps be least needed. And that is, in a sense, intertwined with the issue of access. Now, the capital flows depend on many things. It could depend on, you know, how a government responds to a situation, what its fiscal situation looks like. If you even track, you know, the economic conditions over the last one year, you would have seen many vulnerable countries going through sovereign debt stress. and that again can make countries even more vulnerable and cut off the access because anyone putting money in the market will ask questions on what is the sovereign rating of this country, you know, whether the user proceeds are being used for what had been envisaged. And so the conditionalities that are loaded on top of the funding are quite strenuous for some countries to comply with. So if you look at small island developing countries, They've long faced this problem. Interestingly, at COP27, they have raised uh, their issues with existing funds uh, that were supposed to be available for adaptation, but they're not able to access because of all the processes involved. So I think, you know, both equity and access are in a sense intertwined issues. And to the layman, this would be the primary concern, which is where is this capital located? And what are the conditions that are attached to the flow of this capital? Now, every country has unique challenges. What are India's unique challenges on the climate finance front? I think uh, one challenge that will emerge and will stay for some time is India's language of how it communicates its transition. So uh, if you notice in COP26, the term used for petering out of coal is phase down and not phase out. And I think that's been one of the challenges in the international communities of finance because investors as well as multilateral development banks want to understand what does the pathway of coal phase down actually look like and what does the phase down really mean? I think that is one of the biggest challenges. I think the second one that will emerge, you know, will be public finances and social costs. So, uh, the transition poses the, the same problem again to the Indian economy that no one should be left behind. It should be sort of an inclusive growth. And answering that problem again 
would be, I think, a challenge for the Indian economy. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but how is India tackling them at the moment? And uh, with the union budget not too far away, can the finance minister do something in in it? So I see a great appetite to respond to this new need. One is that you know we saw last year there was an announcement of the sovereign green bond issuance by the Indian the central government, and I think that in itself uh, reflects on the intent to switch investments to greener projects. And uh, we're seeing the details of that being now put out in public. I think that's one to look out for. We've also seen a thrust on infrastructure, which could be related to the green transition, which I think is, again, great effort. Third, we've seen you know significant investments moving to solar. We've also seen that this, the appetite for moving to renewables is great amongst states as well. It's not just the center's initiatives. So I see significant strides being made there. In terms of finance specifically, I would say that each of the regulators in India is interestingly responding on its own on finance. So if you take a look at Securities Exchange Board of India, they have a BRSR, which is you know sustainability and responsible investment reporting standards for corporates, which adds transparency and can encourage flows to investments which are not just you know related to environment but also to social. The RBI recently released a report on sustainable finance and risks within the banking sector, which is acknowledging that uh, you know there are current exposures to fossil fuel industries and there might be a need to move capital around and that again i think is a great step forward and we've had corporate social responsibility spent for many years which also fits in to the plan so i think a lot is happening at the same time and we're seeing some progress which is voluntary in many ways and not uh, you know mandatory so here's the here's the million dollar question do you think we will eventually have a tax on the common citizen in order to finance climate action in india that's an important question, Ashok, because it goes back to your question of who's going to finance this. And as I said, you know, the entire green transition space is not blocks of investment. It's a spectrum of investments. You're going to have those which look like, you know, which are business projects, which can be funded by private sector. And then you will have the other end of the spectrum, which is social investments, where public finance will be absolutely important. And I think uh, over the last one year, there's been a conscious decision to talk about what carbon taxes can do. But, you know, as someone who's worked on taxes for very long, I think a full body of reforms in taxation may be necessary, not just in terms of what we're doing this year, but what we may want to do over the stretch of the entire transition period in terms of rejigging rates or changing tax bases so as to make sure that the revenue lost on account of phasing down of fossil fuels is made up for and all the social costs that are, you know, incidental or direct should be met, you know, via fiscal reform. So I think tax is a very important element of this problem. And to that, also, it's important to say how these proceeds will be redistributed. So it's not just about raising it, but also that they reach the people who are most affected. Sure. But do you think there'll be a tax on common citizens? <laughs> I would say yes. I mean, so there would be uh, incidents of, you could imagine a specific carbon tax if, you know, there is an imagination of earmarking or you would just generally see a rise in tax rates, which would be required to fill in the fiscal gap or financial gap. Right. India is not known for deploying money well. You know, there are leakages, output quality issues, corruption. We can't afford that when it comes to climate finance. That's very true, Ashraf. Just saying that, you know, this is green finance and that takes away all the other legacy problems is not true. So even if you look at investors who are putting their money in the space of climate finance, are still asking questions on, you know, whether business uh, environment is conducive enough, or whether these projects will go through, whether there is bureaucracy in terms of implementing these projects. And I think those questions cannot be left behind or be swept under the rug and they will continue to pose as challenges even if there is a new form of finance flowing for specific activities so i do see you know some kind of proactive approach to attracting green investments but then again it's a full systems approach 
uh, and institutions will also have to adapt if we are talking about the scale of finance that we are talking about. Yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. You know, given the numbers that we are talking about, even small percentages of leakage or loss are actually very large amounts of money. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. Any other sources of money that India can explore? Any new financial instruments uh, that you think could be introduced as we go forward? So, uh, Ashraf, the thing about financial markets is that you know they tend to adapt to the needs. You see the same kind of instruments being used slightly differently. So, for example, we've we've known enough about the corporate bond market in India being illiquid, but what we find interestingly that green bonds have a great uptake, and you have foreign institutional investors expressing their interest. I think one instrument that strikes me as extremely interesting in this space are impact bonds. And what do impact bonds do? It's basically they leverage philanthropy, uh, government sources of finance, as well as private sector capital for very specific outcomes. So those outcomes have to be pre-committed and uh, in a sense uh, determine what the cost of that capital will be. So I think that has been a great innovation and perhaps some stress there on scaling this kind of capital up might be extremely promising for the transition. I want to go back to what you said about green transition not being a block of investment, but a spectrum of investment. So which parts of that spectrum do you think should be a priority for India? Green energy, clean transportation, sustainable food, something else? So Ashwin, if I, uh, if I get your question correctly, you're trying to ask me where in the spectrum would public finance be in? and where, uh, Yeah, where what I'm trying priority? to say is which would be among the top, say, three priorities for India? For priorities, okay. So I think if we look at high emitting sectors, they're of course the go-to sectors if this changes to happen. And, you know, one of the sectors which gets a great deal of interest in the transition space is the power sector. It's also a sector which is at the moment costing the budgets of different states. So I think the first priority sector wherein, you know, the advantages of green transition can be unlocked is the power sector. It would require heavy investments. I think the second and the most emitting sector would be transportation. We've been watching that there are states that are you know, releasing their separate EV policies. Uh, there are incentive regimes. So I think second would definitely be, be transport. And I think third, infrastructure to support all of this. I mean, there are more sectors in the value chain. And we can list this, list them all day long. But I think uh, the, yeah, infrastructure, <laughs> the infrastructure that supports power as well as transport will be extremely important. And I say this because, you know, for EVs to be used extensively, you need charging points. And we're already seeing some interest there. But the question that people are asking now is that how green is a charging point, which then relates to the question of power. So Absolutely. I think both are interrelated. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, this is one of my pet. Uh, I don't want to call it a peeve, but something that I like talking a lot about, I want to find out more about that. You know, this whole business about EVs and charging points. India is so dependent on coal. I mean, last I checked, I mean, what, what's 85% of our energy needs are supplied by coal or something like that. Uh, you know, and if you're going to have more charging points for EVs, we first got to make the transition away from coal. Otherwise, actually, you're emitting more than before. And so, I mean, what you said earlier about it being actually a whole chain of investments that go backwards is so spot on, Suranjali. So, uh, Suranjali, which are the three biggest trends in climate finance that you see over the next decade? So, Ashra, there are one or two things that strike me as, you know, a shift. One is that I'm seeing in certain fractions or for certain fractions of the capital market, there's some change in interest in how investors respond to companies. And there is growing pressure, not just to say that, you know, are you doing this more sustainably for just profits, but also look at, you know, how they respond in terms of employment and skilling of their workers. So, which I think is a very interesting move. The second trend that I'm seeing and is quite divisive at the moment across the world is the use of carbon taxes. So, you know, interestingly, there are countries that want to go ahead and use it as a tool. You would have also heard about the carbon border adjustment mechanism, which the EU wants to introduce on imports into their jurisdiction. And there are countries such as the US, which, you know, sort of sit on the fence about carbon taxes. But I think over the next couple of years, even as uh, big organizations like OECD take this up 
under the agenda. You will see a shift in tax policy as well, sort of ramping up. So I think those two are quite interesting uh, to my mind as developments in climate finance uh, space. Yeah. So far, broadly speaking, what has India done right and what has it done wrong? <laughs> So I think what India has done right is anticipated its own energy demand accurately and committed uh, also very practically on what it's going to do on its NDCs. In line with that, we've seen India's growing response in terms of you know scaling up of renewables. Uh, India is also part of the International Solar Alliance. So I think on the renewable side, we've seen a great commitment from India. I think what India hasn't done right is that they haven't been able to articulate a, a long term plan. They've just released a long term uh, you know, plan to say, but what does this net zero pathway look like? Which sectors will be responding first? Which sectors will come in later? And then accurately, what would be the exact financial needs? Because you know, one is that you have a full number there. But then how is this to be deployed over what horizons and is it actually quite large in comparison to the GDP over the next 30, 40 years? That is not clearly there. And I think this is a question that everyone raises for India. So I think while there are efforts in articulating a vision on renewables, the plan or the pathway of getting there is not quite clear. So Suranjali, tell us about your work at NIPFP. Ashraf, I am an assistant professor at National Institute of Public Finance and Policy. It's an autonomous think tank of the Ministry of Finance. Usual workday is worrying about different policy challenges. Uh, split my time between taxation and sustainable finance. Right. And uh, so here's a question I ask all my guests at the end of the show. Why do you do this work? <laughs> I think uh, it's just the thrill of being part of the change. Uh, just trying to, you know, use my expertise or my understanding of how things work to help solve a problem. I think that's why I do this job and hopefully been able to make some impact. As the world's third largest emitter of greenhouse gases, India is often criticized, but it's also a fact that its per capita emissions are minuscule compared to those of the developed world. Despite that, India must take the lead on climate action because it is among the most vulnerable to the disasters accompanied by climate change. That won't happen unless it gets the financing right. Suranjali, thank you for being on the show. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you all for listening. Please visit allindiansmatter.in that's A-L-L-I-N-D-I-A-N-S-M-A-T-T-E-R.in for more columns and audio podcasts. You can follow me on Twitter at Ashraf Engineer that's A-S-H-R-A-F-E-N-G-I-N-W-E-R and All Indians Count that's A-L-L I-N-D-I-A-N-S-C-O-U-N-T Search for the All Indians Matter page on Facebook. On Instagram, the handle is All Indians Matter. Email me at editor at allindiansmatter.in Catch you again soon. <laughs>